الله صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم If you kindly open your Qur'ans Please open to chapter number 22 Surah Al-Hajj Verses 38 to 40 Chapter 22 Surah Al-Hajj Verses 38 to 40. For the love of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, one loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma sada ala. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani rajeem. Bismillahi ar-Rahmani ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Alhamdulillahi alladhi hadana li hadha. Wa ma kunna li nahtadi ya lawla an hadana Allah. والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين أما بعد فكقر الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم كتاب أنزلناه إليك مبارك ليدبر آياته وَلِيَتَذَكَّرَ أُولُو الْأَلْبَابِ آمَنَّا بِاللَّهِ صَدَقَ اللَّهُ الْعَلِيُّ الْعَظِيمِ صَلُّوا عَلَى مُحَمَّدْ وَآلِ مُحَمَّدْ Awaited Savior of Humanity, Imam Al-Mahdi alayhi salam, my respected teachers, elders, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Chapter or technique number four of Tadabbur of the Holy Qur'an is for us to be able to look at a group of verses in the sequence of how they have been compiled in the Holy Qur'an. As we mentioned previously, Allah Jalla Jalaluhu at times, He may reveal a part of a verse, He may re- reveal an entire verse, He may reveal a group of verses together at once. And also, he may reveal an entire surah together. In the first technique of tadabbur, who could remember what was the technique? For you to interact with the Holy Quran. When the Quran says, Afala yashkurun, what should we respond with? Alhamdulillah, shukranillah. Technique number two was for us to be able to ponder upon a word inside the ayah. Technique number three was for us to be able to ponder upon the ayah. What we will often see is that a verse of the Quran is broken down into sections. Sometimes there is one or two parts, maybe two or three or four. We relate the first part of the ayah to the second, the second to the third, because there is a coherence between them. Just the same way I will have a sentence which is broken down with a comma and a full stop or there's a semicolon. The same way the Quran also is broken down and we can understand one part of the ayah relating to the next part of the ayah. This is the first three techniques. Technique number four is for us to be able to look at the group of verses and for us to be able to relate the first verse to the second, the second verse, the third, and so on. Just as there is coherence in one ayah, there has to be coherence and meaning between a group of ayat as well. You will always, always find that there is a coherence between a group of verses. It could be that sometimes the verses shift to different discussions. Sometimes it could be speaking about one discussion but it will always be expanding some way, deliberating upon in some way, such that there is coherence, connected meaning between those sets of verses. When we read the Quran and we stop and we think about what's being said, we're able to see where that natural group of verses start and finish. It might be three verses, four verses, 
And the same way we looked at the relationship inside a verse from one part to another, we apply exactly the same practice and we reflect on one verse and its relationship to the subsequent ayah. And the second in relation to the third and the fourth until that group of verses provide us with several things for us to be able to reflect and ponder upon. We will do that tonight, inshallah. I've selected a couple of groups of verses and we will see how when we look at them, we look at one verse and relate it to the next and to the next, we will see profound insight that comes out of those groups of verses that affect our personal and our community living as well, insha'Allah. Open your Qur'ans to chapter number 22, Surah Al-Hajj. Verse number 38 to verse number 40. Insha'Allah, it will come up on the screen for you as well. Now, what's interesting about Surah Al-Hajj is that it's not primarily only about Hajj. There are many different discussions in Surah Al-Hajj. For example, there is a review of the Battle of Badr that takes place in Surah Al-Hajj. The actual Hajj that the Holy Prophet went on was in the last year of his life. Correct? This is why we call it the farewell pilgrimage. And then when the Prophet left, Hajj, completed Hajj, he stopped off at Ghadir, Qum. This is where the event of Ghadir took place. So everybody knows that in the 10th year of Medina al Munawwara, after Hijrah, the first Hajj, this farewell Hajj took place. Yet at the same time, Surah al Hajj includes verses regarding the Battle of Badr. 10 points. In which year did the Battle of Badr take place? Should I get 20 points? Ahsant, 20 points, the brothers are ahead tonight. In the second year after Hijrah. So, if Hajj actually took place in the 10th year, Surah Al-Hajj is talking about Things from the second year, you can see across how many years that this surah is revealed and utilized by people. Eight years that this surah, imagine how much it covers across the Madidan period for it to be across eight years of life. Now, knowing that it speaks about Badr in various different places, the context of that I raise to be able to introduce to you this set of verses. It's not about Badr directly, but for you to know that this surah is at least in some part revealed in the second year of Hijrah, and some issues of warfare and protection and preservation of the early Muslim community in Medina, gives you some context to some broader understanding of what you might be reading now, okay? Let's have a look at these three verses. And I want you to imagine that you are in the city of Medina al Munawwara in the second year after Hijrah. How might you appreciate these verses? How might you contextualize these verses? How would you have lived these verses 1400 years ago? Verse 38. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله يدافع عن الذين آمنوا. Surely Allah, He defends those who believe. Now imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling you He defends you. I mean, there's, there's no comparison. There's nothing that could possibly be a stronger force and giver of confidence to you than this. Inna Allah yudafi'u anil ladina amanu. 
ان الله لا يحب كل خوان كفور surely allah does not love anyone who is unfaithful ungrateful now actually here a good translation is deceitful hawan is a very good way to explain it being deceitful think about this because remember we first have to make clear what this first verse is about before we relate it to the second what do you think allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to convey in surah al-hajj by telling us he defends those who believe but he does not love those who are deceitful and ungrateful what might have been going on in early medina al-munawwara that he wants to tell you this Sure, absolutely. Why would he actually use the words deceitful and ungrateful? Because they were munafiqeen at that time. There were some Muslims, they were actually being deceitful inside Medina al Munawwara. You know this, right? That they used to convey, they used to be spies, they used to convey what was going on to the Meccans, they used to work with the Jews of Medina, to bring down the Muslim community inside Medina al Munawwara. So Allah is introducing this section, these three verses, by saying, look, Mu'mineen, you are surrounded by enemies. You have Mecca against you. You have the rest of Arabia against you. Inside Medina, you have Jews and Christians against you. Inside Medina, you have Munafiqeen against you. What better... Thing could you want than Allah revealing an ayah to you saying, Allah defends you. Can you imagine what that did to the Mu'mineen 1400 years ago? And then he follows up by saying, Allah does not love those who are deceitful and ungrateful. So you know that if there are 10% munafiqeen, 5% munafiqeen amongst you, even though you know that they are plotting and planning, Allah's support is not with them. That's what you would have taken away from it at that time. Make sense? Okay, next verse inshallah, verse 39. Now remember, we have to relate one verse to the next. So let's first talk about verse 39. And then I want you to relate 38 to 39 for me, insha'Allah. Udina lilladina yuqatiluna bi annahum dhulimu. Permission to fight back is granted to those who are being fought. Why? Because those who are being fought, they have been wronged. Dhulm has been done to them. What does this mean, do you think? Yeah, defend yourself. So prior to this, the Muslims in Medina were constantly being attacked, constantly being killed. You know what the early Muslims were having to put up with in Mecca. You remember what happened to Bilal al-Habashi, right? Bilal al-Habashi used to have a stone placed on his chest. He was laid flat out on the, on the, the burning plains of Mecca. The this heat of the sun is upon him. That was during the day, the torture upon him. Night, he would be forced to sleep and eat in the pens of the sheep. That was the torture of him at night. And in the morning, his owner, Umayyah ibn Khalaf, used to take a rope tied around Bilal's neck, make him walk on all fours like a dog, and then tell the children of the Quraysh, come out and throw stones at Bilal. That's the three levels of punishment that went to him, torture. Until then, had they got permission to fight back? No, they were too few in number. They were not organized. There was no real army. There was no real opportunity. If you were to fight, you would have been destroyed. After all the 13 years of torture in Mecca and two years of living in Medina, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أُذِنَ لِلَّذِينَ يُقَاتِلُونَ Why? لِأَنَّهُمْ ظُلِمُوا Now permission is given to you to fight. So this verse precedes what event? The battle of Badr. وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى نَصْرِهِمْ لَقَدِيرٌ and Allah is truly most capable. He is qadir to help them prevail over the enemy. What do you think is, what would you take away between verse 38 and 39? What seems to be the theme? What seems to be the message? What would you have taken away then? From such verses. Ahsan, stay fast in your faith. What else? Allah will defend you, grant you victory. What else? Allah will protect you when He's He's with you. Ahsan. There are, be careful, there are munafiqeen amongst you. If you wanted to identify the munafiqeen, how would you use these two verses to identify the difference between mu'min and munafiq at that time? Imagine the Prophet ﷺ is standing here and he gives you these two verses. If you are mu'min, what would you take away from these two verses? Brilliant. If you were mu'min, you would be roused to the preparation of war. Permission is given to you to fight. What would you be doing? Be preparing yourself. You'll be gathering your weapons. You would be saying goodbye to your family. You would start thinking about military tactics. You would gather around the Prophet to prepare. Correct? If you were munafiq, what would you do? Say again? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You would not want to be doing those things, would you? So if, if as an example, there's 90% mu'mineen and 10% munafiqeen, 90% are starting to get their weapons ready, get their horses ready, give finances to be able to help the war effort, and 10% were doing the opposite. These two verses could help you identify who was mu'min and who was munafiq. Immediately your eyes were opened to what was going on. You see, these verses were very, very practical to them. It wasn't something that they read and then closed the book and put it on the shelf. They lived it. They understood it for how it was going to impact their actual life in a community, in building an ummah. And we understand that when we start to really think about those verses as if they were real for us. We're not reading it for the sake of reading it, thinking I'm getting thawab, I've got a stack full of thawab that I'm going to bring with me in my grave. That's what we've done to the Qur'an. Whereas when they read the Qur'an, it actually illuminated their world. It helped them to think through what was happening in front of them. Exactly. Carry on. Yes. Yes. Continue the thought. So this is a technique of tadabbur, which inshallah will come on to. One which will come on to, inshallah, is put yourself in the place of those who received the ayah. And then, once you've understood it historically... You understand it for today's context. How does this actually benefit you today? How do you understand and differentiate people who say they're working for the ummah versus those who are actually destroying it from within? We have thousands of those. We have millions of those. 
If I'm one of those who says I'm working for the Ummah, but actually in the eyes of Allah, I'm destroying it from within, how do I identify myself? You see, how might these verses assist you in the, in the present world? Good. Mm, ahsant. To make sure my words, my actions are consistent with my words. Ahsant. You see, this verse is clearly a verse of mobilization, right? And there's many times when we're called upon by our faith or by leaders to mobilize. It's something happening that we need to put our voice to. It's something where we need to defend people. Imagine these verses were revealed today. You would see the same proportion of people. Some people would just sit at home and not want to participate in helping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember there was a presidential candidate of one particular community, may Allah bless him, one of our communities. And uh, when I was there at the time, and he was asked about, uh, you know, Jafar, will you, if you become president, will you want to keep Jafar on? And uh, he said, and I quote, he's just an activist. They don't want people who are active in the community. They don't want people to stand up. Imagine saying that about the Mu'mineen 1400 years ago. Ah, they were just active in the community. You know, they stood up for the rights of the Palestinians, or they, they, they spoke out against the enemies of God today. Imagine saying that about Miqdad or Abadar. But you have those. Like you said, you have people sitting behind him. He doesn't mean you sitting behind him, huh? Don't feel offended. <laughs> you have people who are talking. They won't get up and do any work themselves, but they'll be very, very happy to pull down everyone else who does work. This is a big problem in the community. Correct? Can you see how these verses are real? Verse number 40. Now this is really interesting. If you understand verse 40... So much of your eyes will be opened. I'm not saying they're not already opened. But so much of the ethos of Islam is enunciated in this verse. I'm going to say that as a preface to you. If you understand verse 40 and relate it correctly to verses 38, 39, 40, I will assure you that you will have grasped a central ethos of Islam that the majority of Muslims in the world do not understand until today. That is how I'm prefacing it with such a level of emphasis to you. Have a read of this. So the preceding verse leads into this, right? You have been given permission to defend yourself. Why? Because you've been oppressed. Why have you been oppressed? Verse 40. الَّذِينَ أُخْرِجُوا مِنْ دِيَارِهِمْ بِغَيْرِ حَقٍ they have been expelled from their homes without any just cause. Who was expelled from their homes? The Meccans. Just in case you need to know the context, it's talking about the Muhajireen, that they were forced out of their homes, forced to migrate to Medina al Munawwara. Illa an yaqulu Rabbun Allah. And you know what they used to say? Our Lord is Allah. So what is Allah saying here? That the muhajireen are being expelled just because they believed in Tawheed. And you have that until today. In modern day India, for example, there are Muslims, and not only in cities, but many a times in the villages, where Muslims, just because they are Muslim, just because they believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, will be 
killed, will be attacked, will be, I mean, the most horrendous of tortures. You've probably seen videos and are more aware than me of what's happening in President or my Prime Minister Modi's India until today. Now Allah says something very important. وَلَوْلَا دَفْعَ اللَّهِ النَّاسَ بَعْذَهُمْ بِبَعْذٍ Had Allah not used some people to repel the aggression against others. Had Allah not used some people to repel the oppression and aggression of a group of people, لَهُدِّمَتْ فَوَامِعُ وَبِيَعٌ صَلَوَاتٌ وَمَسَاجِدٌ يُذْكَرُ فِيهَا إِسْمُ اللَّهِ كَثِيرًا Had Allah not repelled the aggression of some people by the means of others, the monasteries, the churches, the synagogues, and the mosques where Allah's name is so readily mentioned would have been destroyed, would have been pulled down. What does this mean? I'm not going to explain it. I want you to try to make sense firstly. Just not give me an interpretation or a tadabbur. Just make it muhkam for me. In case any of you, you don't understand what is being said in terms of a clear statement. Say again. So not if they had not defended. You're right. Allah uses people to defend one another. And had those people not defended one another, the churches, the synagogues, and the mosques would have been pulled down and destroyed. Does everybody understand that at face value? Is there anyone who doesn't understand it? It's, it's mutashabih for them. Everyone, it's muhkab for you? Okay. What does this mean? Just don't relate it to verse 38, 39, 40. Just tell me, what is the meaning of this sentence from God? Had Allah not used some people to defend others, the churches, the synagogues, and the mosques would have been destroyed. Firstly, who would have destroyed the mosques, the churches, the synagogues? The kuffar. Who are the kuffar in this context? The Makkans, correct? So what does this mean? Had Allah not used some people to defend others, these three places of worship where Allah's mentioned is, name is mentioned regularly, they would have been pulled down. What does this mean? Correct, correct. But specifically, what is Allah saying in this verse? Just stick to the verse. Excellent. Excellent. Allah uses some people to do what? To help protect? To protect everyone, to keep the name of God alive. Maintaining the places of worship of others. So remember, the, where is this surah revealed? Medina. In Medina, there were Christians, Jews, Zoroastrians, and Muslims, correct? Not only were there these different religions, there were different sects. Like we have Sunni Shia. They had, at the same time, hundreds of sects in Medina following different ideas of Christianity, Judaism. Whom was the attack from? The kuffar, the Quraysh, the idol worshippers. Why would the idol worshippers want to destroy monasteries, churches, and synagogues? I understand why they would want to destroy the Masjid of Allah, Masjid Nabawi inside Medina, that makes sense. But why would Allah say, that the kuffar of Arabia also would destroy monasteries, churches, and synagogues. 
Because? What does that mean they would be powerless? Yeah, they will go to Allah. What do you mean by that? Ahsant. The kuffar were not only interested in destroying Islam. They were interested in de destroying anything which was based with Tawheed. They equally hated Christianity and Judaism and Islam and what it represented. They didn't differentiate and say, oh, you're Muslim, you believe in this person, we're going to hate you. A characteristic of the kuffar is that they hate wherever God is and whatever the religions are and whatever the spaces of worship that are there. And so if the kuffar had opportunity, they would just as easily destroy the churches and synagogues and the masjids. They would not differentiate because anything that is within the realm of monotheism and tawheed is a threat to the kuffar and their way of life. You understand? We often think, oh, they're only enemies against us. Oh, have you seen how they've been talking about the Muslims? Have you forgotten how they talk talk, talked about the Christians? Are you blind to that? Have you seen how they talk about the Jews? Have you forgotten about what they've done to the Jews for how many thousands of years? You think you're the only ones to be persecuted because of faith in God? No. Now Allah says, had Allah not used some people to defend others, all the places of worship would have been pulled down. What does that mean? You're talking about Imam Ali alayhi salam. Well, you don't need Arabic for this. What, what, what is God saying? It, if, take Imam Ali alayhi salam, because he wasn't the only person who defended. Prior to Islam coming, and this is a, a very important fact I want you to think about. Prior to Islam coming, religions saw other religions as enemies, as rivals. Sects saw the other sects as rivals, as enemies. Islam comes, and it doesn't want Christians and Jews to see them as enemies, or Muslims to see Christians and Jews as enemies. Allah says, had I not used some people to defend others and vice versa, all your places of worship would have been destroyed. So in Medina al Munawwara, that previously had Jews and Christians fighting one another, what does a prophet, a prophet of God do? What does he teach them? How does he change the vision? How does he reorient the vision of people that yesterday see each other as enemies? How do you do this? Muslims would defend the churches and synagogues inside Medina al Munawwara. What do you think now the Jews and Christians thought of Islam? All of a sudden, you know... For hundreds of years, they're living in the city of Medina, no problems. As in, you know, there's not someone else taking over the city. All of a sudden, the Prophet comes, thousands of Muslims come. All of a sudden, the city is taken over by a new religion, a Prophet claiming to be another Prophet, telling you your religion is wrong. Jesus is the Prophet of God, and not Son of God. Moses will be following me if he's alive. Their whole theology has been thrown in the air. They see this other religion as an enemy, as a threat. All of a sudden, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, wants to shift their thinking about intra and interfaith relationships. Allah says, had I not used some of you to defend others, all of your spaces of worship were pulled down. All of you would have been destroyed. All of monotheism would have been destroyed. Understand the verse? 
It's incredible, isn't it? Let's finish the verse and then I want you to help me think about the relationship between one, two, and three. وَلَيَنْسُرَنَّ اللَّهُ مَنْ يَنْسُرُهُ Allah will help him who helps Allah's cause. SubhanAllah. What is Allah's cause here? Allah uses some people to defend others. And then he says, whoever helps him, Allah will help the one who helps his cause. What is the cause of Allah here? To protect what? Islam and masjids alone? Yes or no? No. To protect faith. To protect the locations of faith. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَقَوِيٌّ عَزِيزٌ Allah is strong and mighty. What's really interesting is, does Allah need you to help defend monasteries? No. But even though he's strong, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَقَوِيٌّ عَزِيزٌ Where does his strength come from in this ayah? You, the mu'mineen who defended the churches and synagogues. That's where his strength is coming from here. Obviously, Allah's strength is beyond ours. But he's saying, my defense of monotheism comes through your sacrifice to defend monotheism. Can you imagine? Imagine seeing religion through these eyes all of a sudden. You know, when we come to a place like this, we're not simply renting out a space. Look at the incentive in this verse. Look at the objective in this verse. Have the faiths not worked together and learned to defend one another, all of you would have been destroyed, Allah says. You're not simply renting a space so you can break your iftar and listen to a dua and go home. Be honest. How many Muslims have read this verse a thousand times but never seen the ethos Never seen how it would have practically changed the behavior and the thinking of people of Medina and Munawwara. Can you imagine how it could change the behaviors of faiths around the world if they just read this verse and thought about it? How would Jews and Christians be with each other? How would Christians and Jews be with one another? How would Christians and Muslims be with one another? Not just friendly. I have to go out of my way to defend you. And when we're talking about defense, we're talking about defense against kuffar who want to attack you. Look at the verses. Look at the three in context now. Tell me, what do you take away from this? Look at the opening verse, verse 38. In Allah yudafi'u Allah defends those who believe. In Allah la yuhibbu kulla khawanin kafur. He does not love the deceitful, ungrateful one. Rethink about this. Is deceitful and ungrateful limited to munafiqeen now? Muslim munafiqeen? Who else might have been deceitful from amongst these groups? Yeah, but remember, sorry to give you this, Jews, Christians, Muslims. You are supposed to help defend them. They are supposed to defend you. You are supposed to defend them. Allah starts this sequence by saying, Allah supports those who believe and he does not love those who are deceitful. Does he say specifically this is in regards to Muslims deceitful? No. What's the sequence of verse talking about? Jews, Christians and Muslims working with one another. Relate the first verse back to the second, back to the third. See the whole context. In Medina al munawwara is Allah calling only Muslims potentially? have Jews that were deceitful inside Medina that instead of working with the faiths decided no we're going to work against the Muslims yes is it possible for Christians inside Medina instead of saying we're going to work with Jews and Christians but we instead we're going to work with the enemy to destroy it from within is it possible yes in Allah Allah will protect those who believe and he does not love those who are deceitful and ungrateful is this verse 
revealed solely to Muslims? Or is Allah telling people, even of other faiths, if you're going to be deceitful towards Muslims or towards Christians or Jews, my love is not there for you. If you're actually going to support the enemies of God by your behavior, you may be a Christian, you may believe in God, you may believe in Jesus, you may be a Muslim, you may believe in God, you may believe in the Prophet, but how many Muslims support practically the enemies by their words, by their actions? You don't think it's the same for Jews and Christians? How many famous Christian priests say one thing, really their actions are nothing more than supporting the enemy of God. Permission to fight was given to those on whom war was made. As they are oppressed, Allah is well able to assist them. Had Allah not used some people to defend against others, all the places of worship would have been pulled down. It's an incredible verse, isn't it? It really opens your eyes to the genuine ethos that Islam places. Imagine now today, when we engage with our Christian friends, Jewish friends, imagine when we have interfaith programs, it really changes the way you think about these events the way in which you engage with other communities, the way in which you engage with friends at work, colleagues at work, so different faiths. We're not simply here as to how we used to think. You know, we're not just simply here to go, oh, the prophet is this, and your Jesus is that, and you're going to hell. And I'm... There's a social bond that mutually protects one another. Please. Yes. No. How do you think at that time Jews, Christians, Muslims would have been deceitful in the context of these verses? And do you get that kind of language today? Of course. Practically, how would they have undermined the building of Medina as an ummah then? Yeah, yeah. If they're not united, you cannot, you will be able to control them. Yeah. And this was very true at that time. So, there's the, have you heard of the Constitution of Medina? Have you heard of it? The Prophet, when he arrived in Medina and Munawwara, he wrote a constitution and made all the different faiths sign it. And in it, it would say, for example, that Muslims must protect the Jews and Christians. The Jews and Christians, if they pay jizya tax, they will be defended. And they use this tax to contribute to the state, to contribute to the city of Medina al Munawwara. Anyone else, the Muslims must raise arms to defend the Jews. And if the Muslims are attacked, the Jews don't have to defend the Muslims with their arms. This was in the constitution of Medina. That's how far, at then point one, like a 47-point document. You can easily Google it. Just Google the words Constitution of Medina. Point one, anyone who signs this document is part of the Ummah of Islam. Think about that very carefully. When you normally hear the words Ummah, what do you think of? Muslim Ummah. Sometimes we say Shia Ummah. Correct. It's one group. From the eyes of the Prophet all those who signed up to this document in Medina, whatever faith, whatever sect, whatever you belong to, you were part of the Ummah in Medina al-Munawwara. You see how these verses became alive. 
part of the responsibility of the ummah was to defend one another, not to attack one another, not to make us weak between Muslims, Jews, and Christians. And this is what we become today. There's the far right Christians here against Muslims. We have so many lobbies where we see Jews and sometimes it becomes the butt of jokes, the way in which we talk about Jews, the way in which we are spoken about. Look at how Allah wants us to defend one another. Yes. Ahsant, Ahsant. In the armies in Iraq and in Hashd al-Sha'bi, it was made up of Sunnis, Christians, because everyone came together to defend against ISIS. Ahsant. We don't have time to be able to go into the next set of verses. I wanted you to be able to look at the next set of verses. I'm going to leave it as homework, and with time tomorrow, inshallah, we'll try to go through it. So maybe if you can read the verses and go through it and prepare for tomorrow. If you open your Qur'ans to chapter number... Five, Surah Al-Ma'idah, verses 42 to 44. I won't read them. Chapter 5, Al-Ma'idah, verses 42 to 44. Your homework is to be able to read these three verses tonight or tomorrow and ponder about the relationship between one ayah to the next, to the next, to the next. What is the relationship between all three verses? What is being said? What could be this message that God told the original recipients? How did it change their community behavior, their thinking, their practices? And how does it affect us today? Inshallah, tomorrow we will practice this same technique number four with these two or three sets of verses, inshallah. Please raise your hands, join me in dua. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hasten the appearance of Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam. To allow us to be alongside him at all times in our life and in our death. If we're to pass away from this world before his coming, Ya Allah, raise us from our graves so that we can partake in the victories of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. Ya Allah, help us to be able to fast better in this month, read the Quran better in this month, perform tadabbur of the Quran better in this month. Ya Allah, help us to reach Liyali al Qadr, help us to reach Eid with our family, friends, and community. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. صلى يا رب على محمد وآله الطاهرين الله محمد وآله